With that, I officially announce the start of the Conference on Spontaneous Symmetry Breaking. Our first talk will be that by the Honorary Chair of this conference, Professor Francois Anglais. I'd like to invite Professor Poir onto the stage once again to chair the first session. Professor Poir, please. So we, we, we'll start with the first section. The first speaker for the first section is Professor England. The title of the talk is The Story of Physics and Friendship. Professor England. Okay, so you know this figure now. You will see the beginning of our friendship. And um, here. Is that me? Yeah. No. <laughs> okay. So I came to the U.S. fall 1959, invited by Robert Walt. He was a professor already at Cornell University to work with him for two years as a research associate. But things turned out very differently. After two years, motivated in large part by our friendship and the success of our working together, we got, we finally left the United States, Robert, his wife, his children, and me together to stay what turns out to be permanently in Belgium. Now, this is a little bit an unusual adventure. So I will tell this adventure and uh, I shall show also in particular some things we particularly liked about what we did, namely the mass generation of elementary particles and uh, some ideas about the birth of the universe and the cosmology. I will tell these unusual adventures, of course. But, okay, so a few things. Robert was born in uh, 1928, that's four years before me, and uh, he was born in New York, in New York, in the United States, I was born in Brussels. And uh, he became professor at Cornell University in 1959, 58. And I arrived in 1959, which is the age where I finished my PhD. And uh, um, between my ending my first error in life, which is doing, uh, uh, well, this was not my first error, but it was one of the first, uh, to, uh, which was uh, doing um, engineering, which I succeeded, by the way. And uh, so, um, so uh, I finished, I was ready to start working in physics in 59, but, uh, and uh, it turns out that during these two periods, 55, 15, 55-59, and of uh, engineering and beginning doing physics. Um, I was assistant to Professor Egrin. Egrin was a teacher at the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris, and he came to give some lectures in Brussels, and um, he also, and he eventually became a, uh, the director of the solid state department in uh, the ENS, and also played a role in the government, in the French government, for the uh, 
uh, development of science. And uh, Robert was looking for, for a research associate in, uh, and for some reason, which will probably come less strange in the end of this, in the course of my talk, he wanted someone who was a European. He didn't trust very much the Americans somehow. And uh, he was born there. But, uh, so he wanted a European, and he knew Agra very well, so he asked him about uh, some recommendation. I turned out I was a good place in the list, so he invited me, and that's how I came there. And uh, so uh, I was, of course, very enthusiastic. That was my first, actually my last postdoc. And, uh, and he came to take me at the airport with a kind of wig which you see immediately that he was not very much interested in consumerism. The, this was really something. And then he took me with that brick to a cafe where we were drinking the whole night and uh, discussing, of course, physics, but also everything, our life, the life, the world, whatever. And uh, after this, I think we already knew that we were close enough to have a good chance to become friends. And so the day after, I went already to the university, and uh, I was given an office, and we start working on many body problems in statistical physics. We work on the blackboard together, or individually, but we always discussed our results. And uh, I will sketch something that was done at that time, which I think, because I want also to show the broad spectrum of all the things that we did. I will sketch a theory of the Heisenberg Fermat magnet that we did. It came out from this uh, relation, and it illustrates the importance of the nambu goldstone theorem in uh, solid state physics. And so, first, let me recall rapidly the first, the lowest excitation of a ferromagnet. I will take a Heisenberg ferromagnet, which is spin a half. These are the poly matrices there. And VIJ is the exchange potential, S are the spin uh, operators. And clearly, this is rotation, and we, this is a conference on spontaneous symmetry breaking. Clearly, uh, symmetry will be broken for uh, the, uh, when uh, the magnetization curve appears, when the magnetization appears, right? So uh, the ground state will uh, uh, represented by that state, which is spin up, up where? Well, we took, let's say, the z direction, spontaneous symmetry breaking. And uh, so we go, you know that uh, we choose the z as a particular direction, so the s minus and the s plus are flip, flipping spin operators. And it will be convenient to go to the Fourier representation for seeing what happens. And um, uh, let's see what happens from looking at the commutator of the Hamiltonian, which is q minus which is a wave representation of the spin operator along the lattice. And uh, we see that there are two terms which will come in. The term commutator with a z, which gives me the v0, and uh, the commutator with s plus, which gives me vq. And so this is the, what the relation with this, which we have get and acting on the vacuum, there are no other terms. So this is all in the limit of n being large. And uh, so the flip of sign between v0 and vq is due to the fact that sz gives a minus sq minus and s plus gives a plus sz, which is nothing else than essentially the one which multiplies v0 here, once you take into account all the square root of n. And uh, <coughs> so this is obviously in the continuous limit 
a uh, zero for uh, small wavelength, for zero wavelengths, which is the expression as we shall view again in a moment of the nambu goldstone theorem as applied to this problem. The amusing thing, so this is of course something that you all know, even if you are not specialist in uh, solid state physics, but the, the, something now is interesting to see what happens if we do this at higher temperature. Now, at higher temperature, we're not going to solve the problem exactly, but we're going to solve it in what's called the random phase approximation in which we uh, take only no transfer of momentum between the different terms. It will be immediately this thing. So uh, uh, we uh, just simplify a little bit the commutation relation and that will make an approximation. We'll see what that approximation is in the course of seeing what it is. And uh, so what we do is add to the Hamiltonian a little driving force, which is Q and uh, frequency dependent, which is this HQEI omega t minus epsilon, and also a constant magnetic field which couples to the z direction, which is the direction of magnetization. And uh, I define a quantity r. Remember that as z is a trivial factor of a half because it's been a half, and uh, so we need a factor of two to get to the Pauli matrices. And uh, r, which is there, is just the sum of all the SZ, average over temperature and the external magnetic field, and divided by the number of spin, going, everything going to infinity, are going to a number between zero and one. And uh, so we compute the uh, susceptibility for this Q and omega and time dependent uh, external fields, external magnetic field, which is there if you wish to induce a spin wave. And uh, we find, of course, uh, two types actually of term. The type of term, we write the equation of motion, which I don't write because this is a small talk. And uh, so you write the equation of motion for the uh, the Heisenberg equation of motion. You have the term that you got previously uh, from the Hamiltonian, which I, are uh, multiplying the SQ minus, which in the, are in here in the denominator, which is V0 by VQ. And instead of, uh, of, uh, of one, you have R, which is a magnetization, because that comes from the expectation value of S z of zero in momentum space and that of course is the sum of the up spin and minus the down spin and so you you have the magnetization per spin which is r r also will multiply the term coming from uh, the uh, uh, time dependent magnetic field and uh, we have also h which is the external field and the omega is there because of the inhomogeneous term in the Heisenberg equation of motion when there is an explicit time dependence. And uh, so that's what you get. And now you, we can relate this to the sum rule. And first we can relate it to the correlations between the S minus, which is the thing which is driven, and the coupling in the Hamiltonian of the S plus. So we can write this to, to we can relate this susceptibility to the product, the correlation of S plus S minus. This is it's called the fluctuation dissipation theorem. And so the fluctuation dissipation theorem, coupled with the sum rule, which is there, gives you the following curve which here comes the total spin relate to the cotang of this expression. Now, if you take just, as a, just a straightforward computation of the fluctuation dissipation theorem. Now, let's first see what happens if h goes to zero. Then r, which is the magnetization, 
starts with one at zero temperature and then goes down clearly up to a Curie point. And that is well represented by this expression where the cotange here, when the numerator goes to zero, goes to one over the numerator. And so you see that the R cancels in the limit, giving the value, if H is equal to zero, give the value of the, um, of the Curie point, which is there, which is F1 over V0, where F1 is this expression. It's trivial from there. Now, what is interesting is that we can make this cotange with a little bit of uh, algebra, we can write it in a different way where its interpretation is very clear. So just fiddle around, fiddle around with the, with the cotange and you can write it like this, where the quantity little n, which is defined to n, one minus r, is just, n is just a sum of upspin and downspin, and r is just a number of upspin minus downspin, so this is just the number of, flin, of spins which have flipped. So it's the number of spin waves, if you wish. And indeed, you just find a boson distribution for spin waves that way, where they are normalized, by R, which means that the medium has become uh, less respondent because the computer, the R has diminished. And, uh, and so you have uh, this, uh, you find what could have been expected, which is that you have a good approximation, with the term good will come in a moment, of the thing just by looking at the uh, Nambu Goldstone boson. And uh, what's more amazing is that now let's put H not equal to zero directly, but H not equal to zero, but let it go to zero in such a way that R over H is finite. And both R and H goes to zero. Now when you do that, you see, you find actually First, you keep the phase transition because when H is not zero, you don't have a phase transition. So you can go on with your spin waves, which has nearly zero frequency, up to infinite temperature. And you can sum them. And the result is, when you do that, that you find a well-defined theory of the Ising model, which is probably correct in the limit of uh, infinite density come back to this, which is exactly the uh, susceptibility of the spherical model, the so-called spherical model of the Ising model. And we are, of course, in a classical region of high temperature. So playing only with spin wave, we go a curve, which is a full magnetization curve, and at the same time, the parametric region up to infinite temperature, and we have not used anything else than spin waves. So that means that you have to be a little bit careful once you have uh, Nambu Goldstone boson in the problem, they may hide very interesting things for you. Now, why did I say it's Nambu Goldstone boson? Here I'm going to do something that Robert liked very much to play with his hands to uh, explain things. And uh, actually, uh, this is not the way he did it for the, the spin wave, but it's easier because it helps me to do later for field theory. So let's suppose that the spin wave, of course, is a precession. So it, you have a rotation about the x and the y axis. But let's we forget for the moment the rotation about the y axis. And the first band represents the ground state. Right? every spin up. Now suppose you rotate half the spin, right, like this. This is an excitation cost, uh, cost energy, but not very much because if you rotate everything, then you go to another ground state because of spontaneous symmetry breaking. Therefore, the excitation that you get is minute. It's just as the rubbing of the near uh, different oriented spin. Now you can do this and you get a wave. 
Now, strictly speaking, of course, the wave is not in the x direction. It's a mixture of x, y direction, which are correlated. And, but that doesn't change the idea. You see that going now from the bottom of the blackboard to the top of it, you have uh, actually a wave, which when the wavelength grows indefinitely, costs less and less energy and end up with zero energy. That's the Goldstone boson theorem, and that is what we applied. So I think it was interesting to a little bit show that here. And uh, yeah, I don't know what it is. OK, I see that I have an image here that I don't have on the blackboard. I hope it will not appear, but I don't want it. But uh, that, uh, that we'll not will see. OK, so we were further analyzing things in solid state physics. We were analyzing spontaneous symmetry breaking, which occurs in the many phase transition. And this was the right time that Nambu discovered that actually this is not the Goldstone theorem, because that's before Goldstone and before uh, Nambu. But uh, it's the same phenomena in solid state physics. And he did it, of course, in field theory and particle physics. So we were very excited by that, particularly by beautiful analysis of superconductivity. And uh, so we think that uh, we were prepared to go to really, we should have done the BEH uh, theory at that time. But, but uh, life is life. This profound uh, statement now that I made uh, is just that uh, uh, it was the N61, and uh, I was supposed to go back to to Belgium. And but by that time we really knew that we were very good friends. We know also that we got a lot of pleasure doing physics together, and uh, so. There's a don't know what we were going to do, especially because I got a great success for some reason in uh, in Cornell University because I I came as a research associate. Next year, I was a uh, assistant professor with a huge course in electro. Uh, mine it is, and uh, the last year when I, before I went, I was. Uh, advice that I have received, if I want to stay, a uh, full professorship there. So I, uh, I was hesitating, but I decided to go home. And what is uh, perhaps more uh, uh, unusual, in a sense, is that Braut had a, uh, a, um, a fellowship he decided to go with me, to, with all his family, and uh, and once he was in Belgium, he stayed. Now, now, I think the best thing to do because I think when I tell it is is what I tell. It. But this is what Braut said in uh, the uh, in what was done for uh, our uh, for my uh, my retirement actually. Things evolve. I am not what I was. Well, I am, but not quite. And uh, so um, here, uh, well, this is something which for me is uh, very emotional in a sense. So he said, Francois refused. I read it because I like to read it. Uh, Francois refused the professorship at Cornell to take a junior appointment in Brussels. This is a measure of his attachment to the old world and his many friends in Brussels. My following him first as a Guggenheim fellow and then as a faculty member at the OLB is a measure of my attachment to him as well as to the European style of life 
and society which Francois introduced us to when we joined him in Brussels. So, end of the first chapter, we are in Brussels, took some time to manage and to do everything there, and uh, in 63 we started to work in the, on this thing and we did the BH theory. Well, we didn't know. We, we like to try to do it with, uh, with fermions and uh, dynamically, it is, but, but, but it was difficult. And so we also wanted to see if it's possible to do it with a simple fermion uh, bosonic field. And Walt came, he was very excited, say, look, it's, uh, you can get immediately it because you uh, take the expectation value of the five field and you get a mass term. Yeah, I say no, but I have uh, one second because uh, because uh, yeah, this is such a movement here which was not needed, and uh, so because uh, uh, so we know that there's a lot of uh, of way to get a mass for a photon. Most of them are not gauging; they are completely out of uh, uh, they are. Uh, uh, and, and valid, and so we have to check a little bit more what is the gauge invariance here of this problem. So uh, uh, we wrote the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the propagator of the bear uh, Yang Mills field, and uh, and then the uh, yes, and and then. What, what the first proposition was to consider that you have, uh, let's say, an expectation value for phi, one, let's say, in the real part, and you have, this is going to give a mass. But that, of course, is not sufficient. Now, why do we, are we interested in that type of approach first? Well, we were focused from the beginning on to have a theory which is renormalizable. We didn't prove the renormalizability, that was it. but we were quite directed towards that problem. And uh, so the only theory that really works nicely and is renormalizable is uh, quantum electrodynamics. And so we wanted to do things as close as quantum electrodynamics, which immediately tells us that what we want is to get Yang-Mills theory and have Yang-Mills theory get the mass. So that was the logic behind. So this was the beginning of what we do. So in a simple case, to uh, illustrate the example, we have the uh, things which is there, I see that. Uh, you're looking at your watch, so you are afraid that I'm going. Uh, well, well, well uh, how much is it, is it I up to? Uh, uh, huh? I, what? Ah, half an hour. That's a little bit better. It's not enough, but it's better. Yeah. But, uh, uh, okay, so. Uh, so that's begin, but that obviously breaks gate invariance. But when you now couple it and see that yeah, there's, there's a third, there's a, there's a second order term coming with the exchange of another particle, which turned out to be just a Goldstone boson. So when you put these two together, then you see that the polarization becomes transverse. And that's a strong indication that this is a gauge invariant theory. And uh, in addition, the scale of polarization there had the pole in Q squared, which of course when you make that go into the whole thing gives you a mass. So you have a mass and it's a nice torque between the two type of particles which are there. The Goldstone boson which gives this degree of freedom to it and therefore breaks the lock that massless vector fields have because they have only two degrees of polarization. So this is the third degree that is there. It's taken from uh, these uh, Goldstone bosons. And, uh, but that's not enough. And then it is the 
field phi 1, which condense and give rise to a mass. And actually, it's even worse because that sign which is there, because there is a mass now, turns out to be a ghost, because the wrong sign, which is very nice, actually, but I don't have the time to discuss everything. I discuss it in private. But it's very nice that it is a ghost, because uh, that's the key of the connection with the unitary gauge. Right. OK, so uh, uh, this is, uh, so we get the mass for this. And a strong indication, because of the conservation of the vacuum polarization, that the theory is gauge invariant. And uh, uh, the generalization to the uh, non abelian group is trivial. And I just put it here. Now, let's do a little bit Robert business, right? And in this case, it's going to be interesting. So we have our scalar boson condensate, which is the phi 1, which is like this, right? So we have the phi 1. And uh, now I redo the business I did for the spin wave like this to construct the Nambu Goldstone boson. And so I have the Nambu Goldstone boson here. Mistake, wrong. Why? Because there's a local gauge symmetry, and that is not an excitation. It is just a redefinition of the vacuum. So the Goldstone boson is out. It's trivial that the, boson, the Goldstone boson cannot exist in presence of a gauge symmetry. You see that immediately here. So these are the spin waves, but they are not there because, uh, because of the gauge symmetry. So the Lambert Goldstone boson has disappeared. And so the symmetry in the sense of gauge symmetry is totally unbroken, and, uh, and vice versa. Once there are no Lambert Goldstone boson, you understand that there cannot be a breakdown of symmetry. So it go, works both ways. Well, you can do that mathematically, but that's one of the nice thing of about uh, thinking that you can do it also as rigorously, but without even writing an equation. And uh, so, well, of course, you can also have a co the condensate which varies. And that is the BEH boson, the phi one, which condensate and give you. And once you extract it from the condensate, you get the beautiful result of CERN, of course. And uh, there is something that was called, was generally called the Higgs potential. I don't know why, because it was done by Goldstone three years ago, three years before. It's the Goldstone potential where with these fields phi 1 and phi 2, uh, you see that uh, the goldstone path, which becomes a fiction in this case, it's just an unmeasurable variation of things, uh, has no energy, is in the, represents fluctuation around the blue curve, and you have the BH boson, which climbs the potential. So, that's what I want to say. But we wanted to check a little bit better the gauge invariance. So we did it for a, uh, uh, we did it for uh, some fermions taking a vector, uh, a vector and an axial vector interaction and uh, use the word identity, which is essentially the same as the one that Nambu used uh, in uh, with PCAC. And uh, once you do that, you see that that diagram actually is transverse. You have to be careful. You have to regularize it because it's divergent. So you have to regularize it in a gauge invariant way, which is the simplest way is to do it a la Schwinger. You open it the thing a little bit. You do the calculation. And when you close it, you get a term which is just the one which completes the GBNU and gives you the uh, case that this is uh, that this is transverse and a result of that word identity. And that we checked in general, it's true. And so we were convinced the theory 
was renormalizable, although you didn't have a proof and it's only uh, renormalizable without taking care of the fact that unitarity is respected, but it should be respected anyway. So, uh, well, this is an amusing thing which I have to tell because it is related to Robert's character. So there was the Solvay Conference in 67 uh, in Belgium where these things were discussed and uh, Robert and I were there not because we were invited because we were not yet good enough for being invited so uh, but we were there because uh, it has it was in Brussels so you come there provided you close your mouth you are just uh, uh, are there to listen so <laughs> Turns out that Weinberg was making a discussion on the theory and expressed, to my opinion, something which was too restrained about the possibility that the theory should not be renormalizable. So I decided, after all, to say something. So I said that uh, it's a result of a, it should be renormalizable. And uh, actually, I said it is renormalizable. I'm sure, I don't be too much, but uh, it's, it should be renormalizable because uh, the thing, uh, because of what I explained. No, sorry, we're not going to say it real time. Now, why do I put that here? Well, because it's a very strange thing. I am a very timid person. Even sometimes you don't believe it, but but you you have to believe it. I'm a very timid person, and so when the secretary came and asked me to write my talk, why is that to her? Well, no, 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 no. I didn't want to. I didn't want to to be uh, getting against Weinberg and think I was very impressed by Weinberg too much. And then, of course, uh, I, uh, I didn't write it down. End of the story, except that 10 years after, uh, we were in Amsterdam. I was with uh, Bernardo Witt and, uh, and um, discussing with him different things. He said, how could you say in, in 1967 that the theory was renormalizable? I say, how do you know that? He said, it's in the proceedings. Which proceedings? Proceedings of the Solvay Conference. I said, That's impossible. I refuse to write it. I said, I don't know, but it's there. He bring me the thing, text, or exactly what I said. So I didn't understand what was going on. So I say to Robert, I don't know what's happening here. Why did they write? Uh, my statement about renormalizability in uh, in the case of, of this. Uh, so, well, Robert said, well, I know it's because I wrote it. <laughs> and uh, so he wrote it under my name. He said, I think this is something that should be should be known that you said that. So he wrote it, but didn't tell me. <laughs> and he wrote it under my name. So this is very gentle and very nice. And I thought that I should have talked about this and, and tell you that. And then, uh, well, this thing actually went noticed by Weltman, who noticed that people should, uh, should learn that, uh, that uh, statement which was there. OK, so now let's go to something else. After all, the universe also is important, so why is it there? So, well, let's try to see. Well, we were always impressed. Oh, I'm full of time, I guess. Huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, uh, I was, so uh, we were always impressed by the fact there is always a negative sign which bothers all the relativistic people that uh, in, in relativity, in front of the conformal, conformal part of gravity, which by accident or not accident is the part that defines the background of the universe. So we were thinking well, that that must have a physical meaning. And uh, so we decided and as you can see here, this started with uh, Broad, Ginsik, and myself, and uh, many people 
somehow here, uh, joined the game to discuss this thing. And uh, so we wrote the action of Einstein and an action of matter. Uh, actually, I didn't write it here not to put too many signs, but we did the improved energy momentum, then so it turns out to be important. Uh, to the energy, the, uh, that means that in, we go, we make a conformal rescaling, if you wish, for a scalar with mass, and uh, we write the gravity, uh, the conformal part of gravity is uh, induced when you go from G mu to G mu to phi. And we take that conformal part, you can immediately see that the sign is different. I did write two terms which regularly should be, but I didn't want to mess too much around in the, in the, in the paper. That, uh, uh, this is the improved energy momentum tensor. In other words, even when G mu nu is zero, you should write the curvature because its variation is not zero and gives a contribution to the energy momentum tensor. So we did all of that, but uh, uh, we do. So now we said, okay, is this not the answer of why the universe exists? Namely, this equation here tells us that the trivial energy momentum tensor, the divergent of the energy momentum tensor in this underlying Minkowski space is zero. And uh, therefore, we were looking at the possibility that there is a transition from zero to where there is no energy in gravity and no energy in the matter to a theory where they compensate because of this unnatural sign. And uh, so the picture is that the negative part of gravity drives matter creation because we put a time dependent uh, effect by making a mass, which when you rescale induce a time dependent effect. And, uh, and this matter creation gives matter, of course, and that matter then in turn drives the expansion because it's okay, and so we can have a conjecture. We also did, because at that time, everybody thought that the universe was open, so it was very nice that you could put the thing, uh, the, the, uh, you could embed part of the sitter space into a, um, into inside the forward cone of the um, Minkowski space by this thing. It's not important, as you can see. I think the fact that uh, we, did, we did that, we were very happy, but that's irrelevant because now we know it's not open, or probably we suppose it's not open. But I think this is not, this is just a trick. I think we should not take this uh, thing too seriously. This is just a trick to have that what is outside the universe, if such a thing exists, doesn't come in and doesn't bring you anything. So the idea is no matter outside the universe, and then you can prove that it's Minkowski uh, using, the, uh, using the conformal theory and anything, you can prove that. But that's not important, I think. So now the idea is, what is the idea? Well, the idea was that you have a transition which we cannot describe, of course, it probably involves uh, quantum gravity, but once you have this transition, you should get a consistency. If this idea is true, you should get a matter which is just what you would get. You, you take an Einstein equation, take any Einstein equation, and look if you can get the matter that gives back that Einstein equation. A priori, the chances of getting this thing is about zero, I think. But it's not zero if we choose the thing to be the sitter and take the expansion. Then it works beautifully. And uh, well, not so beautifully as, as I say it now. You'll see in a moment. So. Uh, you start with the idea, you start of the vacuum, 
with this type of cooperative process, and you see if you can't get out the serious pay, or in other words, inflation, let's say. But that time, inflation was not a common word. It didn't exist. The oil inflation did not exist. So, and you, you did get the city space. And uh, the, the thing is this. You start by embedding the city space in the forward light cone. This is the uh, quantity that you need. T infinity is the event horizon. Tau infinity is the event horizon of the, the city space which uh, means that in the underlying Minkowski space, the tau square minus square, the omega square tau is limited. And, uh, and uh, we also introduce, this comes from the Einstein equation, because tau infinity is related trivially to tau zero, which is just the Hubble length, which is a finite number in the center. So this is just Einstein's equation, and you define a uh, conformal time T bar uh, in which you can write everything. And uh, so the metric of the city space, as you just can be written that way, the forward the city space, in which uh, this is a conformal way to write it with the T bar, or we can write it in terms of an ordinary time with the usual exponential expansion. And we go to the limit where we want to see consistency in the limit of very large time. Large means probably two or three uh, uh, Hubble time, but uh, in principle, large time. So we take the scalar field, we decompose it into creation and annihilation operator. We have the Klein-Gordon equation, and we have a mass term. And the problem is you have to figure that with an initial condition. The initial condition is that sometime in the past, you know which is a creation <laughs> operator or not a creation operator, and you uh, define the Heisenberg state of the vacuum, such a way that is destroyed by the uh, uh, destruction operator. And uh, all of this is very boring but also interesting because you can see in general what is to be expected, that you can put any condition that you want, nearly, you always get the same solution. And the reason is that any departure from that solution goes away because when you have an expansion, you have to get a very strong creation to keep it. And so generally, the, the thing goes back to nothing. And uh, so we, the solution was this. In, uh, the asymptotic solution was uh, given in terms of Bessel functions. And, uh, uh, and there we compute by, uh, uh, with the creation operator or hyperbogovir or transformation, whatever you like. It's the same. We compute the matter, and we get that finite answer. Why finite? There are two ways. Either you say you just take the improved energy momentum tensor, and you take the number of particles created. But the number is not an invariant in general relativity, so people will, can be unhappy. But we have the other condition that nothing outside the uh, universe should, should affect what is inside. And then we can make a subtraction and do the thing completely formally and uh, c compute the T0,0 zero zero with the fact that we have nothing outside, so we subtract, we subtract the finite uh, vacuum energy point outside the thing. The two method gives exactly the same answer, and it's here, and you can compute the, the, uh, the uh, trace of the energy momentum tensor. Dump in the trace, you find that uh, you find what you should find, if it has to work, that the trace is four times the sigma. And this is just uh, uh, asymptotic uh, expansion of the Bessel function, which gives you that. And uh, so you have sigma is equal to minus p, which is the proof that you are in the sitter. Well, for the moment, you have no proof at all because this is just quantum creation. There's no gravitational constant here. So you have now to see 
if you can get this, what, compare this to what the gravitational constant Einstein gives you uh, with the uh, thing. And the problem is that the Einstein thing gives you also something that goes uh, like 1 over t0 squared, which is the Hubble time. And then you get, and that's why I left uh, purposely, uh, I put all the un unity to 1 except the uh, gravitational constant. And you see that you get actually a uh, eigenvalue equation for the mass that uh, can create a universe. That is the part which we are not so happy about because that mass is bigger than the Planck mass. So what do you do with it? Either you decide to throw everything to the garbage, which is one solution, or you try to think, and I'm not going to bother you with all the possibility that one can get by thinking, but it would be perhaps that this uh, Compton wavelength shorter than the black one, or maybe it's black hole that you create, or the, all kinds of things that we discussed. But I am not sure. What I am pretty sure is that the mechanism that we use to get this, maybe it didn't have the right uh, uh, thing, but you could do the usual inflation that way too. So the uh, what I'm convinced is that the basic idea that we had for the creation of the universe and probably also for inflation is that uh, it is due to the negative sign in general relativity for the conformal mode. That I think is right. We'll see. Or maybe not I because I'm a little bit close to disparition. Okay, so, end of my talk nearly. I think I was roughly in time, but I lost my watch on the table, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, I want to say that, uh, you see, he got the Nobel Prize, I got the Nobel Prize, but Bart was dead. And uh, so it is not obvious that things go very fast, that you lose the memory. And well, I am of those who are convinced that he doesn't care about his memory because he's dead. That was my impression about what that first. But we do care. And uh, so I think one should do something and this conference, and I will talk about that later, but that, not now. Uh, uh, that conference is, is an important step in restoring the memory for us of, uh, of the fact that he was with us in a important and even determinant way, so it should be there. And uh, I would just to say that in some country that maybe you heard sometimes of, which is Belgium, you know where it is? <coughs> a little country in Europe. Then there are Flemish, there are Walloons, there are, they kill each other. No, they don't kill each other. They don't kill each other. But they say many bad things about each other. And, uh, but nevertheless, here is something that, uh, you see this nice plate here, uh, is actually the envelope of uh, something that the Belgian government decided to uh, put some new uh, piece of euros or five euros, which is inside this, and uh, which is here, you see. And you see that there he's not forgotten. That's what I think. And also, uh, there are some stamps, and if you want to write me a letter which uh, will make me happy, you can use that stamp <laughs> in which you have this. And then, and this is my last slide, I want to say something that is not what I say, but what my friend and the friend of Robert Bort, Harry Stern, which is unfortunately also diseased, 
and uh, said about him and his character, which I think is so beautiful that I want also to read it. And this will be my last word. Here is, uh, this was done for the, uh, for his 65 birthday, I think. Yeah. The common attitude of the well-bred scholar toward the overwhelming development of present-day knowledge is to take refuge in specialization while cultivating a fashionable veneer of wider interest at the level of a well-written encyclopedia. This trend against the humanistic dream has not penetrated through modern art. In his naivety, or not quite such, he has the firm conviction that all knowledge worth knowing is within reach, not through laborious book learning, but by recreating in its own way. This approach to knowledge is the secret of the success of those who enjoyed the good fortune of escaping academic pedantry by having had Robert as teacher. It is perhaps also the clue of his own success, his own achievement in so many spheres. And uh, that is what I've tried also to illustrate by taking examples of work in solid state physics, in cosmology, and in the known PhD. Thank you. Very interesting talk. I think there will be a time uh, for Q and A. Anyone like to raise any question? Yes. Yes. Please, we, I, because even with my hearing aids, the situation is getting. Yes. Better. Thank you very much. My name is Tasrif. I am from Indonesia, Hasanuddin University. Firstly, I, before I ask a question, I would like to thanks Prof. K. K. Pua for inviting us, neighboring country. I came with my colleagues. Suharyo, um, he's actually associated with Alice, Alice uh, in San. Uh, uh, I was very impressed when Robert Braut moved to Belgium. Yeah. He somehow could see the, foresee the future. Finally, that his work collaborating with you finally awarded with Nobel Prize. Uh, I would like to ask. But which is mo uh, moving from U.S. to Europe, exact, yeah. uh, exactly. And also, you sort of uh, refuse to receive the offer appointment in 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 New York. In yes, Ma uh, the question is uh, with this moving from New York to that, yes. To your place, does he something acknowledge that he could continue what he is in mind collaborating with you uh, unless he collaborated with you in Europe or he could not something do independently, the independently without your collaborations? This is something that I would like to hear from you. Thank you. That I don't know. I think we were very. Uh, we both work in a way that we would not work if we would be alone. That is for sure. That, that, uh, but uh, I'm sure he could uh, have a brilliant career in the United States. We might not be there or there. It doesn't matter. Well, it may matter in, what, in the type of thing we did because this is the result of interference in many discussions. But uh, I think it's something different that uh, made that we came, that he came to Belgium and that I refused uh, this uh, brilliant situation from the university. 
I think it's just that I think that we both knew that the life we can have uh, if we, uh, the life that we, we have is not only the work you do. It's more than that, I mean, it's, there, uh, it, it is your relation with other people, it is your relation with uh, the society you live in, and it's the relation with humanity at the end. And he didn't like, probably, what he saw in the United States. And I can tell you that I didn't like it either. 56 years before Trump. <laughs> what? That was 56 years before Trump. Yeah, but in a sense it was a prediction. <laughs> Uh, next question. No more, no more comment or question. Thank you, uh, Professor.